Back in 2014, just a few months after the 8th gen consoles like the PS4 and Xbox One had hit store shelves, videos such as these flooded YouTube showcasing console killer gaming PCs. It wasn't just because these PCs outperformed those systems, but it was because for the same price, you were getting a much better system overall. However, in 2021, with the current state of the GPU market, this is not possible anymore. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. With the current generation of graphics cards from both AMD and Nvidia, along with the current state of the market, it's abundantly clear that the $100 to $300 GPU market is dead. This was a topic I covered in my previous video where I gave my impressions on the recently announced RX 6600 XT graphics card from AMD, a card that's supposed to be a replacement for Polaris 10, but is priced two tiers too high. I go over that in more detail in that video, so you can check that out if you're interested. Link for it will be in the video description. For this video, what I wanted to discuss was the direction the PC hardware market is headed towards due to the recent trends in GPU prices for manufacturers, and unfortunately, it's not a good one. And I believe that if this keeps up, which I'm sure it will, then in the long term, this could really hurt PC gaming and it will make it look like an extreme luxury for the ultra-rich gamers, which I guess could be said today taking into account current hardware prices. Let's go back about 7 years and take a look at what the market was like back then. I think for these kinds of discussions, it's always great to recap and have some background knowledge as it really helps put things into perspective. When the 8th gen consoles launched back in late 2013, I was quite disappointed with how they turned out, and since then I haven't really touched a console with the exception of the Nintendo Switch. I look at the Switch as an excellent complementary system to have aside from a gaming PC. Anyways, the PS4 and Xbox One were using hardware that was already somewhat dated when they launched and it definitely showed. Both consoles struggled to play games at 1080p, let alone be able to maintain 60fps. Needless to say, I wasn't impressed by the specs they had to offer, as they were comparable to what you'd find on a low-end gaming PC. Aside from that, I just don't like the closed down and restricted console ecosystem, and I also think that paying a monthly subscription to play your games online is quite unnecessary, especially in this day and age. Needless to say, there wasn't anything about them that caught my interest, and the only reason why I had a 360 was because I had a lot of my friends on that system, but as time went on, things changed, and many of them had also shifted over to the PC, so I found myself pretty much invested back onto the PC platform again. Now, following the release of those consoles, there were many people who had also shared the same mutual disinterest and disappointment towards the Xbox One and PS4, and in 2014, you could go onto YouTube and find hundreds or thousands of videos showcasing these console killer builds. Keep in mind the PS4 launched with an MSRP of $399 and the Xbox One launched for $499. For the cost of an Xbox One, you could build a system with a Haswell i3 or even AMD's FX series processors like the FX6300 were decent budget parts if you could find them for around $100 throw in 8GB of DDR3 memory, an R9 270X, and you would have yourself a system that could run circles around either of those two consoles. That's what made them console killers. It wasn't the fact that you could have a PC that could outperform the console, but it was because you could build a substantially more powerful system for around the same price, if not cheaper. That's what was key. That's what I did back in 2014 myself. I built a rig with a FX6300 and an R9 270X, and for 1080p gaming at that time, it did really well. I could play AAA titles with medium to high settings and get 60 FPS. The base Xbox One had specs which included a semi-custom APU from AMD. This contained 8 Jaguar cores, which were just atrocious, and they bottlenecked the crap out of the GPU. It had just 8GB of DDR3 with 32MB of SRAM, which was a mistake on Microsoft's part, and the GPU is equivalent to an HD7750 or R7260 if you were comparing it to something a bit more modern. So, if you were looking at matching the performance of the base Xbox One, you could get something like an Athlon X4860K and HD7770 GHz edition, which were dirt cheap at that point. I remember people selling those for like 70 or 80 bucks in 2014. And you'd save quite a lot of money compared to buying an Xbox One at $4.99 at that time. During that year, a lot of people had noticed this, and I would say there was a tremendous boom in PC gaming because people were opting to build these budget systems that offered so much more over those base 8th gen consoles. 
Then in 2016, when AMD and Nvidia had released cards like the RX 470 and GTX 1050 Ti, with a budget of around four to five hundred dollars, you could build an impeccable system. It wasn't until the mid-cycle refreshes with the PS4 Pro and Xbox One X that both those consoles started to offer performance that made them seem like decent value. However, in 2021, this is not the case anymore, and I will say that if you're someone who's looking to build a gaming PC with a budget that's equivalent to a PS5 or Xbox Series X, save yourself the trouble and just get the console instead because you can't build a gaming PC in that same price range, at least not now due to the current state of the market and prices. I mean, you can build a PC today that can outperform a PS5, sure, but what's that going to cost you? The PS5 retails for $499 at Best Buy, and the discless version goes for around $399. Sure, they're both sold out now, but because the consoles are also in high demand, it just makes sense, but if you can find it in stock and get it for these prices, it's a great deal. In terms of some specs, the PS5 is rocking an 8-core 16-thread Zen 2 CPU. It's got a GPU with 36 compute units with a variable frequency that's capped at 2.23 GHz. And from what I recall, it does have some RDNA 2 features built into it. And it has a theoretical peak performance of 10.28 teraflops. It's also got 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory and an 825 gigabyte NVMe drive. So it's definitely a pretty powerful system on paper. You have to remember that when it comes to consoles, they are definitely more power constrained as they don't have a large ATX power supply built into their smaller form factors. In Digital Foundry's review of the PS5, they showed the console drawing around 200 watts of power under load, which I thought was quite impressive considering what you're getting with respect to performance and visual fidelity. Now on paper, the PS5 sounds like it has the performance of a gaming PC that would have an R7 3700X and an RX 5700 or RTX 2060. But again, performance can vary due to power limitations and a console using a more cut down CPU, having less cash, etc. Along with that, it can really depend on how well a game is optimized for its hardware. I'll give you guys a few examples. In Digital Foundry's overview of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the performance they showed off with the PlayStation 5 was that they were outperforming a PC using similar settings with either a 2070 Super or 2060 Super, and that's definitely impressive. In their COD Black Ops performance test, the PS5 per outperforms the system using an RTX 2070 Super, and Trill's not too far behind a system with a 3070. Again, those are some fantastic results from a console that costs around four to five hundred dollars. But then again, we have instances like this one where Gamers Nexus showed a PC with an R3 3300X and a GTX 1060 outperforming the console by a significant margin, and the 1060 is a much slower GPU. This is just further indication that hardware optimization is so crucial and if done right can really tap the full potential in the hardware to yield some excellent results. And I suspect that with devs just having the ability to have direct access to code for the hardware and work with lower level APIs, the PS5 will more often than not compete with the GPUs like the RTX 2060 Super or RX 5700 XT. But speaking of desktop GPUs, how much is something like an RTX 2060 going for these days? Over at Newegg, we can see it being listed for a whopping $470. That's basically how much the PS5 costs. You can try to sacrifice as much as you want on your other components, such as the CPU, the motherboard, RAM, etc. But if the GPU alone costs just as much as the console, then you're not going to be able to build a console killer gaming PC in 2021. It's just impossible. And this is why... GPUs like the RTX 3060 and 6600 XT look like an absolute joke, and why they offer such terrible value. The only way you'd have a console killer PC build in 2021 is if AMD had launched the 6600 XT at like $199, but obviously that didn't happen, and I think that AMD and Nvidia will probably continue this trend forward into the next generation. This, in my opinion, will kill PC gaming for a lot of people. Many will look at this and go, why would I try to build a gaming PC? PC that costs more than a PS5 or Xbox Series X when it's not going to offer performance that's substantially better to justify the increased costs. I've seen a lot of comments on my previous videos when discussing GPU shortages and many people have the same train of thought. I'm just gonna go get a console for $500 and call it a day. I'm done trying to buy a GPU for $1,000 when it's not gonna even offer that much better performance. Of course, there will still be some people who will justify it by saying it's a PC and it can do other things, but right now we're just focused on someone who just wants to kick back, relax, and game. 
Also, keep in mind, both Microsoft and Sony realized that people want to be able to do more with their systems than just game. Whether it's using the machine as a multimedia device, the Xbox has support for Adobe Vision and Atmos. You can stream Twitch right from your console. You don't need a capture card. And you can also plug in a keyboard and mouse into the console now, and it feels like you're gaming on a PC. The systems have definitely become more versatile than they were before, and they're only going to get better from here on forward. Sure, there will be that hardcore hardware enthusiast that will stick to a PC, but for the average user, a console, the current generation consoles that is, will check pretty much all the boxes for them. Again, this just goes back to the whole aspect of PC gaming being so flexible going back 6 or 7 years because you could build a PC with a $500 budget and have a great time, or choose to spend $2000 and have an excellent time. But with today's GPU market and with manufacturers getting greedy, increasing the prices of their lower end GPUs and shifting the tiers up, the cheapest gaming PC will start from like $800 which is a deal breaker for most people. Refer back to my previous video of most PC gamers only wanting to buy GPUs in the $100 to $300 market segment, but if that segment doesn't exist then they'll say screw it, I'll buy a console, and if I was in their shoes, I'd probably do the same.